welcome to the Unlucky Frog Gaming Podcast. I am your host, Ben Porter, and I am joined on the podcast by my co-host for this week, Charlotte Porter. Hello. How are you this evening, Charlotte? I'm okay, feeling a bit under the weather, but other than that, I'm all right. Um, we've done quite a bit of gaming this week, actually. Yeah, we have. We we played a bit more of Arkham Horror. Yes. We we actually did the full Night of the Zealots campaign. Yes. Uh, we also played a few games of Mystic Veil. Vale. Yes. And I think that's all, isn't it? We were back at D&D this week. We were back at D&D as well, so we can talk a bit about that too. Um, but first of all, um, it, it's been quite a busy week in terms of Kickstarter, yes, hasn't it? there's been lots going on in Kickstarter. Yeah, un- unfortunately our friend... Uh, Mark McKinnon of Wreck and Rune fame, um, he he launched his second Kickstarter for uh, Wreck and Rune, the game that he's known for, and it was, uh, it was shy of its funding goal, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, but knowing Mark, I'm sure uh, he'll uh, he'll be he'll, dusting himself yeah. down and he'll be going back to the fight. I know he's taking the game to UK Games Expo. Good. Uh, those plans haven't changed, and he's, uh, he's, he's even spoken uh, in the Kickstarter campaign. Uh, you know, for anyone that doesn't know, throughout the Kickstarter campaign, the creators um, uh, send periodic updates to the the people that back the campaign, and in the the most recent update, um, I, th- I think he's tentatively um, mentioned that. He's possibly looking at relaunching to yep. coincide with UK Games yep. Expo. That a, seems like a smart move. Yeah. He relaunched just before Aircon? Yes. So that was quite good because I remember him saying that actually some people came to him that had already backed it uh-huh. in order to experience the gameplay and for them to know that uh-huh. they had invested in something worthwhile. And I think that's a really good way to do it so to launch on the back of something or around this the time of something i think is really really good and he and, was and, so and, near and to, and to to coincide with an event I yeah think. yeah that's yeah. that's definitely and he's so you know he's not far off i don't think no i don't think so um it, it was quite unfortunate i think during this campaign and that quite a few high profile kickstarters yeah. launched um yeah. not long after his i mean that the main one that that um that I'm thinking of is the uh the dinosaur island yeah. kickstarter because uh, they they they've um simultaneously launched a second print run with i think two expansions okay um so that that that's that was always bound to pull in a big crowd yeah and is Batman not? I think I think Batman yeah. as well. Yeah, <clears throat> I I didn't really keep track of that campaign to be fair, but um, it is one of these things that unfortunately most people um that that are looking at Kickstarter uh, have limited funds. Yeah, yeah. And so unfortunately, um, have to make choices a lot of the time when it yeah. comes to backing campaigns. I mean, we we know that as well. Yeah. And you, you you just can't back everything that you would like to. Which is why having the chance to actually experience the gameplay. That's vital, I think. Yeah. Um, and he, I mean, he definitely did the the right thing in terms of um, the the sort of grassroots campaign yeah. that he did, where he went yeah. to a, a number of the, the the stores up and down the country. But I, I, you just get dealt a bad hand, I think, in yeah. that um, quite a few big kickstarters coincided with his own. But as I, we, we've spoken about this before, and uh, Kickstarter is such a, a popular platform for launching tabletop games now that I, I think it is impossible um, to to not have your Kickstarter campaign coincide with a game from a big publisher, particularly when you consider the the volume of games that companies like Cool Mini or not churn out. Well, were you not saying actually that there had been some like between two and three thousand games released last year alone? Uh, that I I think it was Mark Cook that yeah. um, that told us that actually um, I I, th- I think it was closer to three thousand three thousand tabletop games last year alone. 
and that's just a little plug for our next Independence Day episode. Join yep. us on Wednesday. <laughs> yep, um, I, I was speaking to Mark and that episode will go live on Wednesday. Mark Cook, of course, the organiser and founder yes. of Aircon, yep. Yep. which is the, the, the big um, analogue gaming convention for the north of England. Yeah. Also, our Patreon patrons will get exclusive early access to those episodes too. So yes, we, we, we are making a point of um, giving a bit more love yes. to, to Patreon. And on uh, that note, we do have a shout out for our newest patron. Yeah. One Mr. Michael Mordor, who I believe is Mordor Painting. Uh-huh. Does the Beeper Miniatures. I take it Mordor's not his birth name. Maybe he may be very well related to the yeah. Denzians of Mordor. Yeah, he could be related to the Buckinghamshire Mordors, <laughs> you know. Yeah, very, very well known and respected family. Probably. Yes, of course, yep. of course. Yep, so yeah. massive thank you for that. Um, we'll get you added to the wall of fame on the website too. And of course, your, uh, your package will be coming out to you shortly. It, it seems like now would be appropriate to actually talk a bit about patreon yeah and what we want to do with that for people that that would like to support us so do you do you want to g- yeah. give the shameless plug well, for patreon then well basically the main point of our patreon is we want to ensure that our content remains free and impartial as possible so no paid reviews we don't want to do paid reviews we want to be as honest with our audience as possible and we felt that crowdfunding would be the way to do that and Patreon seemed like a good platform to try it. Yeah. So we do have we've got three patrons, three patrons, so we're we're fairly small, but we're we're confident that we can we can sort of build on that and garner support. Well it, it lends an air of legitimacy, it doesn't does, it, when yeah. you've you've got at least a few people Shit, people are listening to us. <laughs> yeah. Well <laughs> no, well you've got at least a few people that have yeah. um decided that we're they're that were worth spending their their hard end and yeah. uh, cash on. Yeah. Um, crowd attracts a crowd. As Indeed they say. it does. Indeed it does. But yeah. um, no, and I mean in all seriousness, um, it would be nice if we could to avoid advertisement and things yeah. like that as much as possible. Because at yeah. the end of the day, at the moment we're doing this in our free time, yeah. and we're we're having to cover all the expenses for, for ourselves. it ourselves. Yeah. Um, so it, if you love what we do here at Unlucky Frog and would like to see it improve and get out to more people, then please take a look at our uh, our Patreon page yeah. and uh, perhaps consider supporting us a little bit. Yeah. Um, and we'll, we'll have a link to yeah. our Patreon page in yeah. the description. I think we always do, actually. Yeah, don't we, we do. Yeah. And as is the way with Patreon, there's different levels. So, you know, you've got your basic... Just you know, I think it's one dollar a month or yeah. something, just to support us, and that is that is vital to yeah, our ongoing, counts. you know. Yeah. And then we've got our highest tier, which is our fifteen dollar tier a month, where we're actually looking to do a a monthly care package, where we're going to send out tabletop things on a monthly basis, hand picked by the unlucky frog themselves and sent directly to your door. So that'll be that'll be happening on a monthly basis. But you also get the t shirt, you also get the dice. And just our eternal thanks as well. Yeah, and you will also now get um, early access to certain episodes, yeah. uh, the Independence Day episodes, yes. and, and we just need to make sure that we do that. And yeah. that onus falls on me. So yeah, I you take. are the, you are the queen of social media. <laughs> so I will. Uh, so the, I will the, remedy that. The blame post-haste. rests entirely at your door. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's all your fault, Charlotte. Thanks, Ben. Thanks. Yeah. So don't be hard on Charlotte, everyone, okay? Please don't. Please don't be hard on me. Yeah. So we played quite a bit of Mystic Veil vale this week, didn't we? Did, we? yes. Uh, that Mark McKinnon actually got me for Christmas. Uh, I think um, it was part of the Secret Santa episode, wasn't it? It was indeed episode, part of the Secret it? Santa episode, yeah. yeah. So you can go back and, and listen to the that episode if you want to hear the moment where <laughs> Charlotte receives Mystic Veil. Vale. Yes. Um, it's by AEG. Yep. And it uses their patented card crafting system, doesn't it? It does, yes, which is a really interesting mechanic. Um, so for anyone that's not familiar with, um, 
the patented card crafting system. The game uses tarot-sized cards. So they're the bigger ones, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, they're, they're bigger than poker cards, or poker-sized cards. Um, and you, I think there, there are four decks in the game, um, and so, some of the cards are completely blank. Uh, some of them have got fertile soil on them. Some of them have got corrupted land. Is it? It's, it's, it's something like that. Cursed, cursed, cursed land. land. Cursed land. And um, throughout the duration of the game, you you can purchase upgrades for your card, and and, and it's almost like um, like an acetate. Mm. It, it it's actually quite similar to the. The system that they use in the the gloom yep. card game, yep. where it's an overlay mm -hmm. for your card, and all you do is you slip that into the sleeve over yep. your card, and um, it allows you to to basically create your own cards as you go. It's such so a simple mechanic. It's a really interesting take on the the whole deck building uh, genre, if you can call it a genre. Um, I really liked it. Yeah, and and as as to, to to actually talk about the the theme of the game itself, um, each player plays a druid, and you you're basically building your own veil, aren't yeah. you? It's it's, it's a, a mystical yeah, valley. It, it's a bit like you're you're terraforming and you're gathering uh, creatures to your veil. Um, so it it's a very low conflict game. And I guess if I had one criticism of the game, it's that, um, like a lot of deck building games, at times doesn't feel very interactive. Yeah. I think the first time we played it, we actually ended up playing it separately of each other. You know, like, because um, it, it is turn based, however, the turns don't impact on the next player. Uh huh. So we ended up just, I would continue my moves. And then you, you know, rather than I've done my turn, I'll stop and yeah. I'll let Ben go. There's a little bit of overlap yeah. at times. Um, I, I will say, though, that it, it, to me, um, it, it felt a lot slicker than a lot of deck builders that I have played. There, there's some there's some deck builders like Legendary, the Marvel deck mm -hmm. builder, which I've I not played you've it. not I've played, not played it. it. But um, we, we spoke about it on the podcast before. I, I played it with Josh and... You weren't too impressed by it were you oh, I, I I didn't enjoy it at all mm. um, because it, it did feel like I spent most of the game watching Josh draw cards Yeah. yeah. and al although you know like like all card games um, you do have cards that um, have a draw mechanic and you can stack them all together it, Mystic Veil vale just seems structured in such a way that you don't really spend a long time watching someone take yeah. their turn Um and you, you you draw a lot of cards in you Mystic Veil, vale. so it, it it seems a bit strange actually that um, it's faster than other deck builders. And it is one of those games that the more you play it, the more you realise how it's played. Yeah, you know, because obviously there is a balance mechanic where if you draw too many cursed lands, you you spoil your hand, yeah. and therefore you can't buy anything, and so you want to try and balance out the cursed land. By with you know revitalized land, but you still need cursed land in your deck. Yeah. In order to maintain the system. I suppose yeah, that, I suppose that could be said <clears throat> of any game. But I think you're right in that. Um, although, at first you look at all the parts that you've got in Mystic Veil. Vale, you know, like you've got the upgrades, you've got the Veil vale cards, you've got all these sleeves and things, and you've got these different currencies to keep track of. It seems as though there's a lot of moving parts, but yeah. everything just works together yeah. in a very slick way. Yeah. Um, we we played three games. Yes. And I lost all of them. Yes. Uh, you you did very well at it. Um, the first the first one though there was a couple of points in it. Yeah, that was that was close, but um, it was quite strange because I felt that the I felt like I was getting better at the game. <laughs> but it, I actually was getting worse at it, or it was either that, or you were by far outstripping me in mm. terms of uh, just like picking up the game mechanics. It's it's a good it's a good um, good deck builder. Yeah. Um, I'm I am quite interested to see 
um, how AEG use the card crafting system going forward. There is a game coming out. Edge I of Darkness. Edge it's of Darkness. it's just funded on Kickstarter, I think, a few weeks ago, and it does look as though um, this one is going to focus a bit more on conflict because he, um, it, a lot of it is like hidden information and deploying spies and things. Be- because a, a lot of um, Edge of Darkness is about espionage, mm-hmm. it it does look as though you're going to be in direct conflict with other players. Yeah. Whereas Mystic Veil vale is. It's minimal conflict. Yeah, it's competitive, but it's not combative. Well, oh, you you don't you don't interact with no. players at all. The, yeah. I, I don't think there's a single card. Um, obviously, we've not played the expansion, yep. so we can't yep. speak for them. But uh, definitely in the base game, uh, you you the only interaction you really have with other players is them taking cards that you yeah. potentially had your eye yeah. on. Yeah. Um, but I I am quite interested to see Edge of Darkness. Um. As someone that quite enjoys conflict in games, <laughs> uh, I, I would maybe say that if 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 you're someone like me who enjoys conflict in games, um, Mystic Veils maybe not for you. Uh, maybe keep an eye on uh, Edge of Darkness yeah. um, as as that develops, um, because the the card crafting system alone is 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 very fun, and I suppose. I should say that actually that even though I I lost every game I played, I really enjoyed just building the deck. my cards yeah. and the 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 artwork's phenomenal. Yeah. They've done a fantastic job of that. So just um it, it, like like a lot of deck building games, um a, a lot of the joy just comes from collecting cool cards. Yeah. I think. I think it's as well the fact that you're not just collecting cards; you're making cards. Because you'll probably yeah. never make that. You know, the, the the variables are so many different bits to it that chances are you might never make the same card. No, that's again, true. You know, um, that's true, um, and certainly because of the way the overlays work, they're yeah. in different positions just, as yeah. well. Um, so it means that although you've maybe got a specific idea in mind for a card, depending on the particular um, upgrades mm-hmm. and overlays that you've drawn. Um, you might have to choose a different overlay yeah. in preference of another because it might be that the overlay that you originally wanted is going to block an effect that you're going to need to keep. Yeah. Um. So I think we'll, we'll definitely play Mystic Veil vale again. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I, I, I would definitely recommend it. I think, and I, I might, um, uh, I was toying with the idea of possibly get. Its name escapes me, but there is an expansion okay. that adds uh, leader cards. Oh, okay. Uh, which um, buff all of the cards that you have out in play at the time. Okay. So that that seems like quite an interesting mechanic. Yeah. It it reminds me actually because we're, we're just um, talking about how fond we are of of Mystic Veil. Vale. Um, we decided to sell Fog of Love this week. We did didn't decide we? to sell Fog of Love. It's currently listed on uh, Board Game Geek Marketplace. Yeah, so if you want to buy a copy of Fog of Love from us... Yeah, um, that will go towards the cost towards the unlucky frog. <laughs> yeah, um, go check that out. But um, So, what? I mean, what, why did we decide to sell it? Well, ultimately, I'm not saying it was your decision. It was a joint decision. But yeah. I think you felt stronger. I thought it was a fun game. However, I knew I would never play it again. Um, why, why would you never play it again? I just felt as if... I had experienced it already. Yeah. Within that, we'd only opened one of the um, the the expansion uh, packets you get. With high, it. high school sweethearts. Uh, yeah, one yeah. of the um, scenarios. To be honest, I think you had quite stronger feelings about it than I did. I I, th- I think I think one of the reasons I feel so strongly about it is because um, p- people are showering it with praise. Yeah. And and for me, the the main problem with Fog of Love is that I don't feel that it has done what it set out to achieve. Yeah. It, it it doesn't to me feel as though I'm playing a romantic comedy game. I don't feel as though I'm playing through a relationship. It feels as though you're given a a random bunch of disjointed encounters to respond to it's it's difficult to develop a character when 
uh, one minute you're having your first date, and this is actually possible to do yeah. this in the game. You, this can, you, can, with you, didn't you it? can go from having a first date to having a fight at the in-laws. Yeah. Which is that? That's a massive leap. It's almost like you you end up with this like weird, vaguely connected montage as opposed yeah. to um, a solid relationship. As opposed to you getting to actually yeah. play through a sequential relationship, which is what I thought I was getting. Um, so it's having said that, it is a beautifully presented game. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, <laughs> but. To to continue the relationship analogy, you know, okay. it's, a, it's a really pretty polished girl, but there's not a lot below the surface. I feel that's maybe a bit sexist, Ben. Yeah, but you could say this, right, well, you could say <laughs> it's a very handsome, very well-turned-out man, it's... but he's hollow inside. Okay. Is that better? Well, not, it's not better, both. It either. could be, right. It's a, I, I, it is a sexless okay. thing. It, it's, it's a very well turned out individual. <laughs> very beautiful, handsome, whatever yeah. on the surface, but is quite hollow yeah. inside. <clears throat> yeah. That That's fog of love for me. Okay. Um, yeah, as, I, I just, I, I felt I had, I had no desire left to play the yeah. game. Um, so, and I, it's quite a big game, so it was taking up quite a bit of space on the shelf. Yeah, um, and I, I dare say there'll there'll be someone that buys it and really enjoys it. And I do stand by what I originally said in that it's possibly a good uh, gateway game. Yeah, um, you could play that with someone who has no interest in games, and they'd probably find it, um, you know, at least a little bit interesting yeah. for an evening, but. Um. Uh. Yeah. I. I don't see myself forking out for the expansions no. and all of that stuff. Like you say, very polished. Very pretty. Um, game. Some really interesting ideas. You know, where they get the personality yeah. spectrum and all that sort of thing. But th- for me, that was it. The most interesting part of the game was drawing the cards and developing the characters. Mm, the yeah. the actual um, relationship itself was where it fell flat. Yeah. Um. But anyway. Storytelling games done right. Yes. Arkham Horror. Yes. Um, yes. We, we've we actually played through the whole night of the Zealot campaign and we died horribly. <laughs> we allowed the world to be taken over. It's great fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we're, we've already started our second yes. playthrough. Um, I, don't, I don't really want to spoil anything for anyone. Yeah. And... Um, uh, I think we're we're going to pick up the Dunwich legacy. I think yes, I think we are nice. going to play yeah. through um, the all of the story, and I, I, that that's what's really become apparent to me is that it's not like a lot of the other living card games where um, you 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 do just play like um, a one off pickup game with yeah. it, and then you get a result at the end of it. It is very much designed to be played. Um, uh, as a campaign, yeah, or as a series of linked games, yeah. Um, even down to you know you've got things like trauma. Um, a lot of the cards yeah. they've got the pips on them, which um are what they cost in experience. So the the whole thing is is designed for a campaign play, and I just love it. Yeah, I love the Arkham Horror board game, but um, it's it takes a long time to set up and I I found that it was very divisive whereas the Arkham Horror uh, card game um, takes all the 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 themes and all the the fun stuff from Arkham Horror and just makes it slicker yes Uh, it's it's quite easy to teach actually it's another game where when you look at someone playing on the table you think oh there's a lot going on there but it's all quite intuitive once yeah. you once you know once what you you're, get to grips with it. What you're doing. Yeah. Um, so we're we're on attempt two for the night of the zealot campaign. Yeah. Uh, and we're probably going to play the the second game at some point, and we'll let you all know uh, how, we how, how we get on with that. Whether we fear it as well. Yeah. This time. I suppose the 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 thing is, uh, you do have the advantage playing through the second yeah, time because you, you do know. know um, what some of the choices yeah. result in? Because um, uh, I, th- I think most of them you have two choices, is, don't yeah. you? Yeah. Um, so it does mean that uh, w- we know 
that some of the choices that we made last time did not work in our favour. Yeah, maybe didn't work in our favour. So uh, we'll see if we're, we're able to uh, bring that uh, that story to some resolution. Yep, yep. Looking um, forward to it. Looking forward to it. Uh, we were back at D&D this week, weren't we? We were back at D&D this week. We've been off for a while, just uh, work schedules, yeah, other things going on. Just life happening. Life in general. Um. But we were still uh, doing our, our delve yes. uh, in the abandoned uh, dwarf colony, looking for the... The gems, the jewels? The, yeah, the crazy gems that absorb light. Yes. I can't remember what they're called. Near can I. But they're, uh, <laughs> they're uh, pretty wacky. So far we've found two. Yes. So we're doing okay. Um... I actually found this week's encounter particularly grueling. Yeah. Uh, do you want to tell? Well, it was um, what happened. It was a roper, I believe. Yep. And what's a roper? It, it pretends to be. Uh, oh, what did it pretend to be? I always mix them up. The is it stalactite? Oh, that's right. It was or is trying that a to be. The one on the ground. Yeah. Can I remember? Yeah. The mix them up. Yes. Yes, so whatever one's on the ground, not the dangly one, yeah. not the build-up one. Pretending to be one of those, and it, we went past it, and this big tendril came out and grabbed us. Yep. And uh, then proceeded to grab all of us, which then gave because us... Because the tendrils <laughs> grow back, so even if you cut them off, you just get grabbed again. And when you're grabbed, if you go to attack, all your attacks are at disadvantage. So when you're at disadvantage, you roll two d20s, and you use the lowest... Do you know what it felt like? Do you remember in that film Hercules when he goes up against Hydra? Keeps yeah. chopping our heads off. <laughs> they just keep coming back. Yeah. That's kind of what it felt like. But we got there eventually, literally, I think that's the longest we have ever at been. Le- at least Hercules got some hits in there. We, <laughs> we got nothing. The other thing was it not that the, the um, our hex, what's these, the hex sword? The hex blade. The hex blade. Um, decided to put all of his actions into uh, uh, an enemy just beforehand, thinking it was going to be the big bad, but it turned out just to be like a wee flabby it flan. A, 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 it was a water elemental. And so it, he, he earned himself the... the um, Puddle Bane. Yeah. <laughs> he, he earned himself the title of Puddle Bane after yep. that. But he then also exhausted all of his special abilities. Yeah, so it meant that he wasted them all on this little pleb and uh, we spent ages just rolling dice. We we didn't even get to poke it though. Nothing happened. And it was, I suppose that it's one of the things that I do find um, a a bit arduous at times about uh, Dungeons and Dragons is it, it maybe feels a bit as though things are left a bit too much to chance yeah yeah um because in a lot of games where you roll dice what um you at least get um and you do you get modifiers in D D to be yeah. to be fair and i think you do get more as you level up yeah but certainly um the, there are some times where it does just feel that things happen to you and you have no control over them yeah which you know i've spoken about uh random number generators before and about how a lot of the skill um in those games is responding to things that you have no control over but I feel like that can be a problem with D&D yeah. is that things happen to you that you have no control over and you have no way of responding to them yeah. um, I mean it's, it's it's obviously a very old design template um, it's not changed all that much over the years I'm sure some D&D scholar out there listening to this will be able to refute that point uh, feel free to write in and let us know, as always. Um, but I, I, I really struggled yeah. with that. Um, I, th- I think after the first couple of rounds, I was like, I just want this to be over. And it was. It was something like twelve rounds, maybe even more than that. Yeah. Of ju- before it let us go, not even before we killed it, before we managed to get out of its clutches. And he he was averaging like eighteen damage a hit yeah. as well. Um, so it was it was just that it was a thoroughly unpleasant <laughs> encounter. But we got a jewel. We got a bunch of jewels. We got That's um, what matters. We got a ruby, we got a couple of emeralds, we got something else. We got all the bling. We got one of the stones that yes. we needed. 
Um, it's so all good. We got, we got it's all we, good. We got well. It wasn't all good at the time. <laughs> um, it, it it was um, it was painstaking. Yeah. Um, but as you say, we we got out of it. We got out the other end, and we will live to fight another day. We will. We will. Which is more than can be said for a lot of other D and D characters. Um. Na- namely, your, too your, soon. Your poor rogue. Too soon, man. Too soon. It wasn't a joke. It was. Uh, poor Anias. Anias, GBNF. <sighs> GBNF Anias. <laughs> um, but um, I'm off to Sterling tomorrow for the final battle of our Firestorm campaign. Yes, the final battle. Yep. So. Um, we'll let you know how that goes. I dare say there will be pictures and blog yep. posts and things for that. But it is orcs and dwarfs versus the disciples of Zinch Ooh. and the undead. It's an interesting so, mashup. Yeah, some quite interesting pairings there. Yeah. But that, so this is the the big deciding battle for uh, for the campaign that um, that we've been running for several months now, actually. Yeah. Um, so that will be at Common Ground Games. Yep. Um, so I, yeah. So I will be fighting there today. If you're listening mm. on the Sunday that uploads, the the eighth of April. Um, then next week, we're off to Compulsion. Yes, in Edinburgh. Yes. So it'll be our first time at Compulsion. Yep. Looking forward to seeing what goes on there. Yeah, we've already got a list of people to make a point of meeting up with. Yeah, so if if you're going to be at Compulsion, we will be there on the Saturday. Yes. So come and say hello. That will be Saturday the 14th. We may have some new toys we want to try out too. Yes, we will. We're at some new recording equipment yep. that will be debuting at yes. uh, Compulsion. But yes, if, if you are at Compulsion on Saturday the 14th, we will be there we will in be our there. unlucky f- frog regalia. So yep. make sure you come and say hello. Yeah, good to see you. Good to meet you. Yeah, but on that note, I think that uh, covers like... everything yeah. for this week. Yeah. Um, thank you again for listening. Yep. Uh, make sure to tune in to Wednesday's episode so, where yep. we will be talking to Mark Cook of, of Aircon. Aircon. Um, but until then. Thank you for listening, and we will see you again. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Hi, everyone. It's Charlotte from the Unlucky Frog Gaming Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Now be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. All you need to do is search Unlucky Frog Gaming. You can also show your support for the Unlucky Frog through Patreon. To find out more information, check out our website, www.unluckyfrog.com. Thanks. Bye. (laughs) Bye.